Hello, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome. We are so happy to have you here. Uh, for those of you joining us here on the Zoom, you probably know the deal by now. This is a webinar format where we can't see or hear you, but the chat feature is enabled. And we really do want your questions and comments, your experiences as this presentation goes. Um, so please do make use of that. I want to welcome anyone joining us on YouTube. We do not have a way to moderate chat through YouTube, so just preparing you for that. I want to thank and acknowledge my co-host, Dr. Joshua Walewa, our Director of Career Services here at the Brown School. Um, Josh is going to help moderate the chat and contribute to the discussion uh, towards the end of the program. Before we get started, I want to just let you know a couple things that are coming up. Um, we are now in a every Tuesday, this is our normal time slot, schedule really like through the end of this, this fall semester. So there's all kinds of great things on the Open Classroom website, many programs for you to uh, choose from. We'll be back here next Tuesday when Meg Krejci um, is going to give a presentation on mindfulness practices to prepare for the school year ahead. Um, she's a Washington University wellness uh, consultant, help us get ready for what's coming. And then on Tuesday, August the 3rd, uh, we're kicking off a brand new series we're doing called Inclusive Perspectives um, regarding various experiences, research or practitioner wisdom around inclusion of people with disabilities. Um, and so Steve Folsch is our lead off speaker and he's gonna be talking to us about the power of language. Um, so do look for that um, from us here at Open Classroom this year, sort of a, a renewed focus and, and commitment to raise those issues. But now I wanna to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Kaylee Cornelison is a 2010 alumna of the Brown School from our Masters of Social Work program. Her career has focused on helping adolescents have the tools to have healthy relationships. She's done that here in St. Louis, at Safe Connections and Wyman Center before moving into a training role in Los Angeles County, California. Now she's back at her undergraduate alma mater, University of Michigan, where she's the lead program specialist for the Adolescent Health Initiative at the School of Medicine there. So she's here to help demystify part of the virtual world and some all too common unfortunate experiences people are having. Here to talk to us about pics, text, and tracking, understanding and addressing digital dating abuse. Please welcome my friend Kaylee Cornelison. Thanks, Janet, and thanks, Josh, for having me. That was a really good introduction. I was going to introduce myself, but I think you hit on most of um, everything. Um, I'm Kaylee. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And yeah, I'm coming to you today from um, beautiful Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this topic um, was really the reason I got into social work in the first place. So dating, violence, sexual assault prevention um, was really... Um, where I got my start, and as Janet mentioned, folks from St. Louis might know Safe Connections. I worked there right out of my MSW program, and um, this particular topic around digital dating abuse, wow, has really evolved um, in the last many years. Oh my gosh, I have another U of M alum maybe in the in the audience, so go blow to you too, Danica. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm really excited to present this topic for you all today. Um, Technology and adolescence is a topic that I present on regularly and have a big passion for, for us sort of thinking about it in a um, youth-centered way and not a tech negative way. And I think you'll see that as we sort of go through the presentation today as well. So um, I welcome your comments and questions in the chat. I'm usually pretty good at catching those, but I know Josh and Janet are here to flag me if I miss anything. And there'll also be a couple of opportunities for folks to um, engage and answer some questions as well. So I hope that you do that. So here are our objectives for today. I hope by the end that you'll be able to define digital dating abuse and how it connects to larger systems of power and control. We're going to review how digital dating abuse shows up on different social media platforms and how it may impact young people's mental health. We're gonna explore how dating, digital dating abuse can look different um, for youth with different identities. And then we're gonna, at the end, talk about some strategies to open up the conversation with young people um, who may be experiencing or perpetrating um, digital dating abuse. So let's start with a short activity here about 
your impressions of some behaviors that may be healthy, unhealthy, or potentially abusive. So go ahead and chat in. If you consider, if your adolescent clients were doing the following or have the following done to them. Messaging someone 10 times without a response. Let me know in the chat, would that be healthy, unhealthy, or abusive behavior? Unhealthy. Okay. Depending on the content, unhealthy or abusive. Healthy or unhealthy, depending. Haha, <laughs> Angie, you might have caught my trick very early here. Unhealthy. Okay. Yeah. So it could be, I think, maybe falling into any of these categories. So you might think of a time when you've texted someone 10 times without a response. Maybe you're concerned about their whereabouts or what's going on with them. You might have a bunch of questions in a row, or it could be unhealthy where I'm sort of pestering somebody with out their consent, or it could be abusive again, depending on the content of the messages. So there's a lot that depends on maybe the context and the content when it comes to multiple messages. How about this next one? Sending 50 texts back and forth with your partner in one day. Tell me in the chat, healthy, unhealthy, or abusive. See one vote for healthy. Could be good communication, uh-huh. Context dependent, uh-huh. Unhealthy, depends on, yep. Depends on the subject matter, yeah. So again, we might think of a time we look back on a text thread with our partner or maybe a best friend or someone and we see, oh, wow, yeah, 50 texts back and forth with one day, especially for an adolescent, for a young person, that is probably going to be pretty uh, typical if it's someone that we talk to a lot. Yeah, if both partners agreed upon that. It could be healthy. It might just be part of our usual communication style if we're going back and forth. Um, and again, it might depend on the context, but usually if you would ask a young person, this would be maybe even on the low end of how often they would be texting back and forth. Well, the next one, following all of their partner's friends on Instagram and Snapchat. Healthy, unhealthy, or abusive. I see unhealthy, could be healthy if the partner's on board with it, uh-huh, depends. Unhealthy or abusive if not friends themselves, could be. Unhealthy, depends. Yeah, a lot of these are really, yeah, <laughs> content dependent, yeah, and that's sort of my trick here with these is just to get us thinking about these different types of scenarios. So it could be that this is really normal in my friend group. When we start dating somebody, I follow their friends on Instagram and Snapchat, and that's how I get to know them. And we start hanging out sometimes in person, but we also interact on Instagram or Snapchat. In a different context, if I'm trying to sort of keep track of my partner's whereabouts, figure out what they're doing, where they're going, who they're with when they're not with me, that could be a red flag. So again, we're thinking about content and context um, when it comes to a lot of these behaviors. A couple more here to keep us thinking. Asking their partner to send an explicit picture that no one else will see. Yeah, unhealthy, abusive, Yeah, it's definitely risky. Yep. Okay to ask if the answer is no, then they push them, then it could be unhealthy or abusive. Good distinction there. Yeah, caution against it, but could be potentially healthy, probably a bad idea. Yeah, I love that y'all are picking up on some of the nuances of this because 
Um, again, depending on age, this could be very risky behavior, right? Because um, if the person in the picture is a minor, we could be crossing into some um, child pornography and um, folks who can't actually consent to have those images out there in the world. So we could sort of get into some legal issues with that. Um, depending on if the person feels pressured, if the person shares the picture after they've received it. Um, again, what is the context of the relationship? Um, and yeah, it sounds like some people have had experiences with um, dealing with um, pictures that have been shared between minors. So yeah, there can be a lot of different legal consequences for them if that is the case, if the person in the photo is a minor. So again, yes, cautioning against that. And also we're thinking about the context of whether we're sort of tipping into abusive territory, maybe just from unhealthy territory. All right, and I think they have one more here, posting on social media that they have had a fight with their partner. Unhealthy. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of unhealthies here. Yeah. Typically unhealthy, and we could even sort of roll into that abusive side of things where I'm using that as a way to sort of put them down, to control them, to get other people on my side. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those tactics that folks might use um, in a little bit. So thanks for participating in this sort of thought experiment with me just to get thinking about some of the nuances of these different types of behaviors. Um, how they might show up differently depending on the relationship between the two people and when they can sometimes um, sort of tip, like I said, into that uh, behavior that is um, abusive and not just unhealthy. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. So our strategy number one is just to be aware and to know the facts. And so we're going to talk about what is digital dating abuse. So digital dating abuse is a pattern of technology facilitated controlling behaviors exhibited by one person towards another, the current or former romantic relationship. And so notice here that I have pattern in bold. So it's a pattern of behaviors that are facilitated by technology. And when we say technology, that can mean phones, it can mean social media, computers, really anything that sort of falls under that bigger technology umbrella. And again, here's a different definition, using technology to repeatedly um, harass a romantic partner with the intent to control, coerce, intimidate, annoy, or threaten them. So note that, that it's a pattern of behavior, um, like we're, when we're thinking about um, typical abusive behaviors, it's not a one-time thing, right? It's a pattern of behaviors that are meant to control another person. And in this case, we're thinking about how those behaviors are perpetrated via technology, um, social media, texting, phones, etc. So there's a couple of definitions for us to work off of. And I want to share some, some stats around um, a nationally representative sample of middle and high school students who have been in a relationship, and this is from the Journal of Interpersonal Violence um, from 2020, just to give us a sense of how common digital dating abuse um, is. So these were 12 to 17 year olds who reported that they have been in a relationship. And one thing that I wanna say, I kept the, the wording of this research study true to what they published, um, but just want to know that they use he or she um, and they don't account for any non-binary young people or young people who, or who use they, them pronouns here. So but a lot of the research around dating abuse in general is very gendered um, and, and this study itself was as well. So just wanted to note that. So you can see here that about 28% of the youth in this study who had been in a romantic relationship had been the victim at least one form of digital dating abuse. So a couple of examples that they looked at in the study were having the contents of their phone, tablet, or other device looked over without their permission, having a partner prevent them from using their cell phone, tablet, or other device, threatening them in a cell phone text message, 
posting something publicly online to make fun of, threaten, or embarrass them, or posted online or shared with others a private picture um, without permission. So sort of all together, we see about 28% of these young people had experienced um, digital dating abuse in some form. Um, that study also showed that 35% had been the victim at least one form of offline dating abuse. So there's quite an overlap. So I think what we can take from that is that um, it's not usually just isolated to online tactics. When we see digital dating abuse, we often see in-person physical, mental, or emotional abuse within that relationship as well. They go hand in hand in most cases. So a little bit of other data, just again, so we know what we're working with here. 81% of the students who had been the target of digital dating abuse had also been the target, like I said, of traditional dating abuse. Um, again, they break this down on the binary, but 32% of males and 23% of females reported experiencing digital dating abuse. So slightly higher for males in this study. And like I said, the study did not account for non-binary or trans youth um, in, in their research. Other demographics such as sexual orientation, race, and age did not impact rates of digital dating abuse. Um, but I would venture to guess, just from my own experiences working with young people around dating violence, that the, um, the tactics used or things that were said or shared um, look different based on um, sexual orientation, race, age. So for example, young people who identify as LGBTQ+, um, who are in um, abusive relationships often are given threats of being outed to family. There's often comments made about their gender expression or gender identity, put downs used around that. So it's important to know that while the rates weren't different, the way that it looks um, and the tactics that are used might be dependent on those young people's identities as well. So a couple of other research studies to note here um, was that in social work research, again in 2020, they did a study of 70 Latinx youth. Um, and that result showed that they experienced digital dating abuse. And there was again, a strong link between digital dating abuse and offline forms of dating abuse. So similar to the current study that we're looking at. And then the Urban Institute 2013 um, did a study on technology, teen dating violence, abuse, and bullying. And it showed about the same rates of digital dating abuse to this study. So this study showed 28%, that study showed 26%. So not much about that rate had changed, surprisingly, between 2013 and 2020. So again, important to keep in mind, although we're more maybe using technology in the last couple of years, this research from 2020 wasn't that different from some research that had been done about seven years prior. So those are some of the facts and definitions around digital dating abuse. But I want us to also try to understand the bigger picture here. How do we put this in context of um, what we might call as traditional dating abuse or um, power and control as a whole when we see that? in um, abusive relationships. So I'm sure many people are familiar with the power and control wheel. This is an adaptation for teens specifically, which I find really helpful. Um, and thinking about some of those strategies that I already shared around how people perpetrate digital dating abuse, which of the um, parts of the wheel you think could be perpetrated via text or via social media? So which parts of this wheel do you think could be perpetrated via text or via social media? Yep, y'all are right, all of them. Every single one of these could be perpetrated in a, in a digital space. So I'm just wondering, looking at this wheel, thinking about these different strategies, we've got peer pressure, anger and emotional abuse, using social status, intimidation, minimizing, denying, blaming, threats, sexual coercion, and isolation and exclusion. Are there any specific examples 
that come to mind for you. So how, for example, could peer pressure be perpetrated in a digital space or how could threats be perpetrated in a digital space? Yeah, isolation. If someone doesn't respond, you feel bad, right? So it's the ghosting, right? It might be that I'm not responding to messages. I quit responding abruptly. Good example. What other examples could you all think of? Yeah, apps that forward your text to another phone without you being aware. Yeah, using for gaslighting, confusing people. Yep. Enlisting peers through social media. Yeah, so we can see that with the peer pressure or even um, intimidation using social status. Yep. So if you have other examples that come to mind, feel free to share them in the chat. I'm going to share a few here. So for example, peer pressure, constant text messaging, where are you? What are you doing? Who are you with? Um, could be an example of how that's perpetrated in a digital space. Anger and emotional abuse, we can see, you know, hurtful messages um, or social media posts about the person. Um, and sometimes that can be even tougher on young people because I have my phone and I'm rereading and rereading and rereading what that person wrote about me or said about me or just sort of obsessing over the text message. So that can be um, even more hurtful a lot of times um, when it comes to that emotional abuse piece of so it's being perpetrated via text message or social media. Using social status. So an example of that could be saying they have to keep a certain persona on social media or ask permission before they post something online. So that was one way to sort of manipulate uh, using social status. Intimidation, you know, could be stalking or using their phones for tracking or tracking folks on social media platforms. Um, there, even if I'm not downloading a specific app that could track me, um, even us as adults will often tag ourselves where we are. We take a picture and in the background, it looks familiar or we have share my location enabled on our phones and we don't know all the ins and outs of them. Same thing for young people. They're a lot more tech savvy, but sometimes they don't always know all of the ins and outs and things that could be potentially making them unsafe in these types of relationships. Minimize denying and blaming. So for example, it's not a big deal. Everyone shares passwords slash reads each other's texts. Just let me read your text messages. You don't trust me if you don't let me see your phone. What are you hiding? Right, so that kind of pressure or blame or minimizing. Threats, so threats really can encompass a lot of different things, but one example would be threats to share private messages or pictures, threats to out them on social media. Um, posting private conversations, forwarding private conversations or comments. Um, there's a whole plethora of things that can come from threats there in the digital space. Um, sexual coercion. So again, we talked a little bit about this in the, in the warm up. So pressuring them to send sexual photos or videos. Again, that could be coupled with a strategy like minimizing, well, everybody does it, it's not a big deal. If you really love me, you would do this for me. If you trusted me. I'm not going to share it with anyone, et cetera. And then controlling who they can act with. So that could be a big piece of the isolation or exclusion. So blocking them on social media, someone mentioned in the chat, like not responding, um, blocking them or their text when we're upset. And then when we make up, I unblock you um, or saying, oh, you shouldn't follow this person on Instagram or don't Snapchat that person um, are just a couple of examples of that. So you can see, and these are just a few examples, how all of the strategies that we, when we think about power and control and um, these relationships that are in the abusive territory, when it's a pattern of these types of behaviors, how really all of them can be perpetrated in a digital space. And um, they often overlap into the quote unquote real world. Although I hate using that term because 
the digital space is very real for pretty much all of us, adults and young people alike. Okay, so here's a book suggestion in our in our comments to 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now. Oh, interesting. Don't let the title suggest that he's opposed to social media. That would be I'm not familiar with that resource, but I'm actually that's a great segue into my next uh, strategy, which is not to demonize social media. Um, I think that one thing that we can do kind of inadvertently sometimes is to really say, Oh, my gosh, Technology is ruining our lives. Social media is horrible. Um, it's it's not going away though. And I think that's something that, especially as adults, we have to sit with that. It's gonna be a big part of our lives probably for the foreseeable future unless the internet explodes, which I don't think it's going to. So it's really important to remember that technology, social media, it is here to stay. If anything, in the last year, it has become more common um, for us to need to be connected via technology. In a lot of ways, it can be healthy um, for young people to interact that way because that's really been their one social outlet that they've had in the last year and a half when we've all been sort of stuck at home. So again, just to give us some context, this is from Common Sense Media, which is a great resource. I'm a huge fan of theirs because I think they take a very... Um, I like to say tech neutral approach, the facts, here's the information, here's what, here's what something for you to consider. But just, and this was from 2019, so pre-pandemic times, this research that they did, this is social media use by tweens and teens nationally. Tweens were using about four hours and 44 minutes, and teens were using seven hours and 22 minutes of screen, daily screen use. I will, I'm really looking forward to when they do this study again in a couple of years and see how that's shifted. Um, of course, I would guess that it's higher now over the last couple of years because of the necessity of online school, et cetera. And then also again, um, smartphone ownership has also ridden, risen dramatically, even among the youngest tweens. So we can see, they sort of look at ages from eight to 18 here. And they did this study also in 2015 and then again in 2019. You can see the rates of smartphone ownership have increased. So demonizing social media um, isn't really gonna get us anywhere. We wanna know again, what to look for and some of those red flags and warning signs when it comes to these unhealthy behaviors. Because often we didn't necessarily grow up with so much social media and technology, or maybe we were um, kind of on the end of it, like Facebook was coming out when I was in college, which is maybe dating me a little bit, but maybe we were, maybe have some younger folks in the audience who had Facebook or social media when they were, were teens. Um, it's really important for us to know, like it's a part of life for all of these young people. And we still have to be teaching skills and strategies for how to use it in a healthy way. If that comes to relationships, friendships, identity, et cetera. We're obviously focusing on relationships today, but there's a lot that goes into it. And we still have to learn that as adults and um, help our young people understand how to set boundaries. What are the red flags? What are the warning signs, et cetera? So again, here's what we need to, we need to know what to look for. So again, this is some research from fall 2020 about um, teen uh, social media platform preferences. So the platforms with the highest engagement were Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok were the top three. And the ones that young people said were their favorites were Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram. So if there are three social media platforms that you're wanting to be a little bit at least familiar with is those three. And this is the strategy that I always recommend to people. If you are not familiar with one of those, download it and check it out because the more you can sort of understand how it works and what it looks like, the better conversations you can have with young people or better yet, ask the young people that are in your life or that you work with to show you how to use it. They might be pleasantly surprised that you're asking them that, but that's really gonna give you an insight to how it looks for them and how they use it as well. So those are the top three. As of 2020, 
Uh, that was a year ago. So we'll see how that changes in the next couple of years. This really changes fast, especially TikTok skyrocketed in popularity um, sort of in, in a very short amount of time. So these things do change, although Instagram and Snapchat have been pretty popular for a while. So again, we have to keep asking young people, what are you using? What are your friends like? What, what platforms you're mostly on? Um, as you can see, Facebook's number six on the list on both of the lists. So for those of us who grew up with Facebook, we're old now. <laughs> it's way less and less relevant. Yeah, interesting that it doesn't include online forum sites such as Reddit. And I think that this study, this in one in particular, oh, it does include Reddit. Reddit is number eight on the, the highest social media engagement um, list but it doesn't look like it shows up on the favorites list. Oh no, it's number seven. Yeah, I missed it too, actually, that when you first said that, I was like, oh, that's interesting, it's not on there. But yeah, it's not as popular as some of the others, but it definitely is on there. Yeah, good to know. And I'll admit, that's one that I'm not as familiar with. I sort of know what it is, but that's y'all's homework. If you're not familiar with um, a couple of these different platforms, you may wanna check them out and just sort of get a sense of what they are. Because again, they are tools that young people use um, and we can be those adults to help support them and how to use them and what's healthy and what's safe and looking out for some of those red flags. So speaking of red flags, from the research, here are some of the common forms of digital dating abuse that we see. And um, a lot of these came out in our examples with the power and control wheel. A couple of these came out in um, sort of the healthy, unhealthy, abusive exercise that I had us do at the beginning. But here they are. So preventing a partner from using a cell phone or computer. So, you know, you can see that sometimes in like a play sort of way. Oh, I'm taking your phone away from you. I'm hiding your phone from you. Um, it's really important to get the context on that. Is that a controlling behavior? Is it a part of a pattern that someone's using against their partner? Um, to keep that in mind. Posting something publicly to make fun of, threaten, or embarrass a partner. Looking through their phone without permission or pressuring them to let you do so. Again, we can get into that minimizing piece. Oh, come on, everybody does it. If you trusted me, you would let me do it. Sending threatening messages, pressuring to send explicit photos or videos and or sharing them or posting them. Constant messaging. So these are some of the top ones. I'm wondering if there are others that y'all have seen that I'm missing from this list that you wanna add. Okay, so it sounds like maybe this is getting the, the overall gist of things. I think that um, tracking, while it is definitely a strategy, is maybe not as common um, as some of these others, um, but definitely still one to sort of keep an eye out on. And I think often when we think of tracking, we might think of like, oh, they've put a specific app on their phone or something to really keep keep tabs on them. And that could be the case, but I think it's more often we see it, like I sort of mentioned before, like, oh, I see where you are based on your social media posts, or I've turned on a, a, a piece of your phone um, that already exists. So I might have find my friends enabled. It's not called that anymore. It's, um, gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it on the iPhone, but there's just one little setting that you can turn on where you can sort of share your location, that's what it's called, um, so that people can, can know where you are. Um, I turn that on so my wife can see me when I'm out running and know that I'm safe, but it can be used obviously um, in an unhealthy or abusive way as well. Yeah, so a couple of examples did come through here. So hacking into a partner's accounts to post things in their name. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen that, or sometimes it's just easy as I take someone's phone, I don't even have to hack it, right? I can pick up their phone and they're already signed into all their social media accounts. If I know their password or however I'm going to get into their phone, 
it's so easy for them to do. Yeah. And that can cause a lot of issues. If I'm trying to isolate someone from their friends and I send something mean to a friend, that's a quick way to isolate them from those people. Really good example. Thank you. Ah, oh, potentially a partner puts in a wrong passcode on purpose to lock another person's phone. Really good point, Monica, right? So if there's so many times that you put in your passcode, it's going to lock you out. Um, and that's a good way to prevent someone from using their cell phone or computer or your social media accounts. I lock you out because I put in the wrong password too many times or I changed your password because I knew it and then I changed it. Yep. And sort of what Yvette was saying there, taking passwords that were stored in a browser. So Peggy, good question. Where does bullying fit into all of this? And I think that it's an adjacent thing, but not the same. So um, when we think about the definition of digital dating abuse, we're thinking about um, a current or former romantic partner. And bullying is typically not a romantic partner type of situation, but a lot of the strategies could be the same. So thanks for that question. Yeah, also people posting their info on online sites. Yeah. Posting on adult dating sites. Yeah, and I think that, gosh, we could really go down a rabbit hole when we're thinking about um, the risk of trafficking um, for young people when it comes to um, digital spaces. That's a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to cover today, but um, if it's relevant, um, I can also share, Janet, some resources around um, trafficking situations because we, we do see that with young people um, when it comes to online spaces and how it could be used to facilitate some, some trafficking um, types of situations for them, unfortunately. Thanks for your examples, everyone. So we can see it, and it can take a lot of different forms. So I wanna show one short video, but I guess the thing that I wanna say before I move on is that it can take so many different forms. And I think that when we're thinking about digital dating abuse for ourselves, but also for the young people that we work with, is going back to sort of those definitions or that power and control wheel. So what are these behaviors all adding up to? Are they being used as a way to um, control, have power over, threaten, um, coerce somebody, right? We don't have to know every single example or be able to predict exactly what folks are gonna do, but when they're used as a method to gain power and control over one partner, um, and it's done with in a pattern of behavior, that's when our, our red flags need to be going up, right? So if we kind of take it back to what's the definition, what are those uh, sort of bigger buckets on that power and control wheel that can really help us help us identify um, those different abusive strategies and then help the young people that we work with um, start to identify those strategies too. So I wanna show you a short video sort of thinking of this um, constant messaging strategy um, that was on the slide before. And I just think this is such a good example. The video is a little bit old, but um, it's such a good example of how it can feel to somebody when they're getting these constant messages. And, and the video is called textual harassment, which I think is a, is a clever name. So here we go. Um, G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. Text me back. Hey, did you tell your parents about us? Let's skip first period together. Did you get all my texts? Is practice over yet? Where are you at? Are you with your friends? That's L A A A A M M E E. Capital X, lowercase O, capital X, lowercase O. I love you. JK, I hate you. JK. Are you ignoring me? We're in a huge fight right now. This is something I did. I can see your lights on. I'm coming this over. What'd you dream about? Me? Holla back. Holla back. Let's try something new. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. So 
So that's from, uh, I don't know, I don't think that they actually have this video on their website anymore, a website called that's not cool.com. And they sort of talk about this, some of these lines between caring and controlling. And when does caring become too much? And when does it sort of um, tip your uh, behaviors into being too much, being used to control, use, being used to have power over and starting that conversation. Oh gosh, Monica, thank you so much. Everybody, um, if you are chatting in, I see that there's a few now. Um, when you are chatting in, um, there's a little drop down that you can say, send the chat to panelists or panelists and attendees. So if you want everyone to be able to see your comments, your wonderful comments that you've been sharing, um, please choose panelists and attendees. I've been reading a lot of these out loud, but um, it's nice when everybody can see the whole thread. Thanks for that reminder, Monica. Yes, and the video is on YouTube. You can just search uh, textual harassment. So I really like that as an example. Um, when I did prevention education um, with middle and high school students, we would often show this video as a conversation starter. Um, to really get us thinking about where is that line between caring and controlling? How many texts without a response is okay? What do young people really think about that? And then sort of framing the healthy, unhealthy or abusive, depending on the context. So I think that's a really helpful conversation for young people as well. So speaking of starting the conversation, um, here are a couple of strategies that we can use to sort of get our conversation going when it comes to digital dating abuse. So screening, so I work, um, I guess I didn't say too much about this at the beginning, Janet mentioned it in my um, bio. I, my full-time job is that I work for the Adolescent Health Initiative, which is where we work with healthcare providers and health centers to become more adolescent-centered in the work that they do. Um, and we do talk a lot about risk screening. And so there are some risk screening questions that can be added to, if you work in a healthcare setting, to a risk screening tool, or if you're doing an intake, like with a therapy client, you might wanna consider adding a question or two to your intake that relates to um, healthy relationships, um, but also potentially to these um, digital dating abuse behaviors. So I really like this first one. Um, that asks about in the in the past month, have you been threatened, teased, or hurt by someone? And it says online, or excuse me, on the internet, by text, or in person, causing you to feel sad, unsafe, or afraid. So I think that that's a really helpful question because it's getting at not just romantic partners, it's sort of getting at that bullying piece that Peggy mentioned, um, but it's also calling out online by text or in person, getting them to think about all those different spaces. And then the other question could be, have you ever, have you, has anyone ever physically injured you um, or forced you to have sex or be involved in a sexual activities when you didn't want to? So again, that's sort of a, a more general question in terms of um, sexual assault or coercion or physical abuse, but those are a couple of helpful questions when we're thinking about um, dating violence. We could be doing on a screening or an intake form. And then there's also a, um, screening tool called HITS, which is not the best name for a screening tool for intimate partner violence, but um, there's a, a, you can find this readily online. It's, it's not, a, doesn't have a paywall around it, um, but just to sort of do some screening around some of these unhealthy and abusive behaviors. So another way to get the conversation started is raising awareness. Um, if you're in a setting where um, you have the opportunity to raise some awareness around these topics, so maybe you're in a community organization, um, it's a great time just to ask young people about their relationships. Um, we could also use social media to raise awareness about dating violence and about digital dating abuse. Um, awareness campaigns, prevention education around dating abuse, the warning signs. And I often find that young people are really hungry for information about what is a healthy relationship. So we're not just covering the unhealthy and abusive, but like what could a healthy relationship look like in the context of a digital space? How could that feel good or make you feel good about yourself or be appropriate? And 
what are those healthy boundaries, having that more in-depth conversation with them about that um, and really talking with them about what they can do and what that can look like versus only focusing on what not to do in the red flags. I find that young people are really, really hungry for that. So <clears throat> sort of in the vein of um, embracing social media, I have two really short TikToks here that are both awareness raising campaigns um, around digital dating abuse. So the one, um, the person in the video looks to be an adult and the other one, I think the young person is, is actually an adolescent. So um, I really liked both of these and I wanna show them for you briefly now. They go pretty quick, but um, I think you'll get the picture. Red flag. Red flag. Red flag. Red flag. So she's sort of going through a couple of different uh, um, behaviors that are all red flags um, and pointing those out. And then here's another one that um, a young person made. So that second one's a little bit longer and I love that she sort of calls out love as respect as a resource, takes the relationship quiz. Um, I'm not sure, I, my guess might be that this young person um, had to make an awareness campaign for a project of, of some sort, but um, I just thought it was a really nice example of um, how to use a, a really popular social media platform to spread awareness and sounds like, um, folks have opportunities uh, to check out other. So VSS Prevention is another TikTok where they talk about healthy relationships and other social emotional topics. So thanks for sharing that. It can be a great place to really um, learn, but also uh, a good way to target young people and get them thinking about these topics as well. There we go. Okay, and so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about strategies for intervening. I have a couple of case scenarios here. And um, we'll try to leave five minutes at the end for questions. So we'll see, you know, kind of how far we get through these scenarios. And again, I'm going to be asking for your um, sort of input about um, what you might do. So scenario number one, your school, uh, you're a social worker in a community-based organization. During a routine in intake, your new client answers yes to the following intake question. And this was the one that we just looked at. In the past month, have you been threatened, teased, or hurt by someone causing you to feel safe or un sad, unsafe, or afraid? They've answered yes to that. How could you open up the conversation with her during your initial meeting? So what are some suggestions about how to open up a conversation about their yes response during your initial meeting with them? Yep, can you tell me more about this? I see you answered yes to this question. Can you tell me more? Sorry that that happened. I know it takes folks a minute to type sometimes, so. Yeah. 
We've got our social work open-ended questions down pat in this group, I see. Yeah, so we could say, I noticed you said yes. That was my response to you. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I could also let them know, you know, this is something that we see often. Um, tell me more about that so that, so that they know that it's not uncommon. Yeah. So your client goes on to tell you that her boyfriend has been making negative comments about her on social media, commenting on photos and videos that she looks like a slut and telling her that she better deactivate her Instagram account or he'll break up with her. She tells you he's really sweet to me the rest of the time. He just gets insecure about the photos I post. I'm thinking about just and not posting anything new for a while. How could you respond? So we're sort of seeing here sort of some of this minimizing, right? He's really sweet the rest of the time. He's just insecure. Um, here's maybe something I could do to temper this behavior. How might we respond next? Mm -hmm. Going back to feelings. Yeah, good idea. How does this leave you feeling? All right, just for the sake of time, I'll sort of share some initial thoughts. So you could share, I'm concerned, right? Hearing that he's making those negative comments concerns me a little. Oftentimes when that happens, there are other unhealthy things going on in the relationship. Is there anything else that he does that makes you feel uncomfortable or put down? sort of opening that up, right? Um, it can be um, tricky to come right out and be like, well, that sounds abusive or that sounds unhealthy, right? We don't want to start labeling things really quickly off the bat because um, that can really uh, have folks shut down, right? Because often when young people are in these situations, same thing for adults, we're not going to always notice these red flags are coming together into a pattern of behavior. It really take some time to sort through that. Um, and folks are usually very hesitant to leave their relationships, right, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, they feel secure. There's some sort of social benefit to being with that person. Um, there are, you know, oftentimes we see folks leave relationships and get back together. And that's because of, again, a lot of different reasons. It could be part of the um, manipulation, fear, um, et cetera. So there's a lot that sort of gets into it. So my suggestion is sort of to unpack things slowly, but also start to think about safety if some of that comes up in the conversation. So I'm aware I'm getting a little bit short on time. I have about five minutes left. And I did have a couple of other scenarios um, that I won't go through right now, um, but these slides are going to be available to you. Um, after the webinar, I believe they're already posted. So, oops, that's sending me back. So with those couple of scenarios, I'm just gonna jump ahead to some additional strategies to have on hand. So having safety plans on hand, but we're not always, like I said, scrambling to that if we see one of these red flags. So not always expecting to use them, but knowing some of those safety plan strategies, especially when it comes to um, digital safety. And I have a resource on the next slide that um, gives you an example of that. Um, understanding, like I said, fears and hesitations about leaving the relationship or breaking up. Um, validating feelings, but also pointing out unhealthy patterns or behaviors. Identifying other social supports, because we know that isolation can be a big part of these tactics. And then again, if this is not um, your area of expertise, knowing your referrals and resources um, where you can get more information or refer out if, if that's a better strategy for you. And speaking of resources, um, Love is Respect is one of my all time favorites. Um, they have a whole section on what is digital dating abuse, but also 
um, some information on online personal safety. Local resource, of course, is Safe Connections. Um, other online resources are uh, a thin line. Dot org, um, Cyberbully Research Center. So they do actually, even though it's a bullying research center, they do have some information about digital dating abuse. Um, that's not cool.com, which I mentioned before, and Common Sense Media, which is more focused on um, technology and, and the digital space as a whole um, and how young people are using technology. So with that, I have three minutes to spare <laughs> for any additional questions, um, but also if there's any announcements from Janet or Josh, um, leaving a little space for y'all as well, but um, always up to the wire because there's so much to say. Well, there's so much to say and the audience did such a beautiful job of participating in the conversation as it went. Yeah. Haley, thank you for all of that. Um, we'll give people just a second because it does take a, a minute to type up a question, but I, I thought to ask you to comment on the role of parents in this and particularly as we consider various ages of young people involved in relationships, um, you know, evolving as they evolve and kind of tricky there too as, as uh, grownups who care about younger people. Um, any words of wisdom for us? Yeah, it's such a good question because it's that fine line between asking about it, um, connecting with young people about it, and then also allowing them to have some of that autonomy. So I would encourage parents or other caregivers to try to talk about what, are, what sites are you using and how are you using them, and then how to set healthy boundaries around um, not only social media use, but also friendships and relationships. And when it comes to their, to their social media use, I would, I would caution against, um, going through their phones, <laughs> especially without their permission because of how tricky that is to regain trust after doing something like that, but also setting limits on, you know, when are you using it, how to stay healthy around that, not have too much screen time and doing other activities too. Um, so really opening up that conversation about technology use in general, but also how is it impacting your relationship and sort of getting to know that part of their life as well. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was just to, to the panelists, but yes, Safe Connections Connection coming through in the chat. Thanks. It sounds like we're getting ready to wrap up. Just one final question uh, for you. What has, where has law, the law for, or the legal system matched up with uh, this type of issue when it comes to, to this type of abuse? Have, has there any been any research on that or any? adjustments made? That's a really good question. I can't say that I know as much about that aspect of the work, um, to be totally honest with you. I think historically when, it it's, when it's come to um, sort of offline dating violence or intimate partner violence in general, um, it's very hard to, for example, get a personal protective order or to make a case where um, someone needs to face legal action. And of course, there's so many barriers for folks and wanting to involve law enforcement based on their identities. So I think especially for young people, gosh, they would, <laughs> that's one more system to navigate that I think they're often very hesitant to do that. So as I don't know much about it, but those are some, some of my initial thoughts. Thank you for that. So we are pretty much at time. Kaylee, uh, is there any final thought that you wanna leave this group with? Gosh, I would just say, ask, <laughs> ask about this. You know, we, we have to open up those conversations and, um, you know, doing it in a, in a way where we're not demonizing either young people being in relationships or social media or technology in itself, but really being curious and, um, using that as a basis to build trust. Wise words. Thank you so much for pulling Thank this information uh, together for us, for 
um, sharing your your wisdom from your years in the field. Josh, thank you so much for co-hosting with me. Um, to the audience, always appreciate your engagement, um, the perspectives that you bring. Thank you for playing along. It makes it much more engaged and enjoyable. So um, we are at time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Please stay healthy and safe out there. And we hope to see you again very soon at another Open Classroom. Take care, everybody. Thanks.